So when speaking of the meninges, I kept mentioning that the brain is floating in cerebral spinal fluid that's contained within the subarachnoid space. So today we'll deal with that cerebral spinal fluid, how it is made, where is it located, and what its function is. The cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, surrounding the brain in that subarachnoid space is one location, but the cerebral spinal fluid we will see is made and flows within cavities inside the brain. These cavities inside the brain are the ventricles. So I want to look for a second at the formation of the ventricles during embryonic development because hopefully it'll help you understand how you end up with these fluid filled spaces in the middle of your brain. So your central nervous system begins as an embryonic tube. Here the tan or gold parts are the embryonic nerve cells forming that tube and the blue represents the fluid filled canal inside of that tube. So you could think of this as kind of a garden hose where the hose itself is the embryonic nervous tissue and the water inside the hose is the cerebral spinal fluid. So as the embryo develops, the tube grows out to form the different regions of the brain and those fluid filled cavities form what are called the ventricles of the brain. So the adult ventricular system has a very complicated shape and looks radically different depending on what view or section you're looking at. And you'll also want to look at those ventricles in relation to other brain structures to find the landmarks that you can associate a given ventricle with. So there's four ventricles. The first two ventricles would be one and two, but nobody could decide which one is number one and number two, so they just call them left and right lateral ventricles. <laughs> There is a hard to see passageway connecting those ventricles called the interventricular foramen. Then medial and just inferior to those lateral ventricles is the third ventricle, which is sandwiched between the structure called the thalamus. Branching off the third ventricle inferiorly is a canal called the cerebral aqueduct, which connects to the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is in between the cerebellum and the pons. And continuous with the fourth ventricle and the ventricular system in the whole, as a whole is the central canal of the spinal cord. So if you were to take one of these cross sections at a different plane or a slightly different angle, you'd get a very different look. So it really helps here to look at some of those 3D images. Looking at the visible body app, what we're gonna do here is remove different sections of the brain in order to get a better look at the ventricles. First, let's dissect out the right cerebrum and highlight the lateral ventricle, or at least part of it. And let's get rid of the other side of the cerebrum here to look at the structures very closely associated with those ventricles. So here you see the right thalamus that's nestled in inside the lateral ventricle. And there are other subcortical structures uh, let's look here on the left side and remove all those so that both sides will look the same. The thalamus, the thalamus, but we're going to remove the thalamus as well to take a look at that third ventricle. And then the other important structure for locating those ventricles, just medial to the lateral ventricles, is the corpus callosum. A white matter tract that we'll talk about later, but for now, let's remove them to get a better look at the lateral ventricles. And with them removed, you could get a view of the lateral ventricles uh, from a dorsal view better. And then we want to remove a lot of these brainstem structures so we can get a better look at the cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. So here's the third ventricle, easily seen when the thalamus removed up here. And then the canal leading below it is the cerebral aqueduct and below that the fourth ventricle. So I encourage you to play around with these apps and to look at the ventricles both in context and with these structures removed. The cross sections can be very confusing and ventricles are hidden in these lateral views because they're deep within each hemisphere. So cerebral spinal fluid is produced in those ventricles and circulates through the ventricles deep inside the brain, but that cerebral spinal fluid also flows out to the subarachnoid space surrounding the brain. So one important function of the CSF is physically protecting the delicate brain by providing cushioning support and buoyancy by floating the brain. The other function is a physiological one 
And that is it provides a controlled chemical environment for the precious brain tissue. And so we'll go over how it does that, but first we're going to follow the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid from production to circulation within, around, and out of the brain. And one thing to notice here is that although there's about 500 mils per day circulating through these spaces, the total volume that your ventricles and surrounding structures can hold is only about 150 mils a day. So CSF is continuously being made and somehow disappearing by magic. Or is it? We'll find out. So to start at the beginning with the production of cerebral spinal fluid, you want to look at any of these models and look for those red structures uh, within the ventricles. Each of the ventricles have these red structures and these red structures are called the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus is a structure made out of the fine capillaries inside the brain and a specialized glial cell called ependymal cells. These are one of the four central nervous system glial cells we'll learn about later. So blood filtrate leaves the capillaries in that choroid plexus space. And this is one of the few places in the brain where there's a free exchange between the capillaries and the brain tissue. And keep that in mind once we get to discuss the blood-brain barrier. So that filtrate, along with oxygen and glucose and the good stuff, also may contain toxins, pathogens, and neurotransmitters that may be circulating in the blood. I'll pause here to mention that a healthy, functioning brain requires a highly controlled chemical environment. The interstitial fluid of the brain tissue and spinal cord, that is the fluid that is in contact with the neurons, is filtered from the blood using two main mechanisms. One is the blood-brain barrier, which we'll talk about in the next part of the lecture, and the creation of cerebral spinal fluid is the other. So you have the blood filtrate around this choroid plexus structure, and the ependymal cells absorb that filtrate and simply put, make them safe for brain tissue. And then they secrete that filtrate into the ventricles. That filtrate is the CSF. The CSF is now safe filtrate that could exchange gases and nutrients within all the brain tissue surrounding the ventricles. So those choroid plexus structures are found within each ventricle and make CSF there. And that CSF flows with th within through the interconnected ventricular system inside the brain but will also exit that system into the subarachnoid space where it will surround the outside of the brain. So the brain and the spinal cord are bathed in this cerebral spinal fluid. So not only does the CSF float the brain and spinal cord, that superficial brain tissue can safely exchange gases, nutrients, and waste now. So as I mentioned before, the ventricles are producing more CSF than the system can hold. As the CSF circulates within the ventricles and the subarachnoid space, it builds up waste and carbon dioxide and needs to be clear from the circulation. The CSF therefore exits the subarachnoid space into the spaces called the dural venous sinuses. These spaces, or sinuses, forms in between the pockets of the dura mater surrounding the brain. This space contains large collecting veins which can reabsorb reabsorb that used CSF back into the body and so becomes mixed with blood and dealt with like the rest of the blood. On a side note, while we're here, in the procedures known as a lumbar puncture or commonly a spinal tap, the CSF from the subarachnoid space surrounding the spinal cord is collected and analyzed for toxins or pathogens that might be specifically in the brain tissue. All right, and that's it. Make sure you understand these key points for the lecture exam. That's it. Next time we'll talk about the blood-brain barrier. See you later.